Val is a registered psychologist with extensive experience uh, in working with alcohol affected individuals across a lifespan and so we're pleased to have her here today. She has presented at numerous provincial, national, international conferences on FASD. She has been a member of the Alberta Medical Association for the FASD Practice Guidelines Review Committee. So she's really well entrenched in the FASD world and that's great. Um, she also works with a number of agencies and government bodies at local, provincial, and national levels uh, to ensure that there's appropriate psychological assessment procedures um, and to ensure diagnosis is standardized for individuals impacted with FASD across the uh, lifespan. Dr. Massey is also an adjunct professor at the University of Alberta and maintains a very busy private practice in neuropsychology. So with that, I now turn the mic over to Val. Thank you very much, Val. Thank you so much. Um, and as though those of you in Alberta know, we're having just really bad weather today. Um, so it did take us a little bit of time to get set up, and I do apologize for that. Um, I don't know whether entrenched in FAS is the word. Maybe it's embedded. I think that's kind of, if you're going to use the military term, that's kind of what it's like now. Uh, you get into it and you can't get out. Um, and, that's, and that's fine. That's fine. Because I think this is a population that uh, up until maybe the last 10 years hasn't been well served, certainly, ha certainly hasn't been well recognized. And I'm so honored and so pleased to be part of this uh, training process that's gone on not only in this province but throughout Western Canada and, and basically throughout North America. I'm still hopeful that, you know, and, and I've done a lot of workshops over the years, I'm still really hopeful that what we'll eventually do is just work ourselves out of a job. Uh, but I've been saying that now for at least 12 years and, and it hasn't happened yet and I keep running into little horror stories. Um, and I always start off, you know, presentations, even though they're supposed to be quite formal, I always start off with a story because it's one of the reasons that keeps me going. And there's a couple of stories I can share. Um, I was just recently, thank God, in Arizona, where it was a lot hotter than it is right now, uh, right after Christmas, and sitting around the pool, and doesn't that sound nice, but sitting around the pool in Arizona and talking to someone else that was staying at the same place that we were, my husband and I were, were staying, and she's had a fair few glasses of white wine around the pool, right? Quite a few glasses of white wine around the pool, frankly. She's getting fairly disinhibited, and she orders up another one from the obliging pool boy, and, and her husband leans over and says, shouldn't you cut back a bit? You're pregnant. This was not a young woman, <laughs> you know, this was a woman who was probably in her mid-30s. And, and in the half an hour that I'd been there, she'd had three, right? She'd had three, uh, and shortly to be four. And this was, uh, this was a Canadian woman. This is a woman from Montreal, right? So we still have lots and lots and lots of work to do, lots of work to do. The same trip, we were at uh, a really nice little restaurant. The woman beside us, quite a young girl, uh, ordered a mojito. If you've ever had a mojito, those things are lethal, holy. Um, and she was pregnant. The server came back and said, now you know what, I noticed you were pregnant, so what I did was I made you a non-alcoholic mojito, it's better for your health. That's the server. And of course she didn't say anything. She said, oh fine, that's great, that's great. And I went, whoa, okay, that's not bad. That's not bad. So there's always, you know, hopefully a silver lining to every cloud. But I'm up here out for dinner in this nice little quiet restaurant here and a crew come in and there's five women and three of the five women are noticeably pregnant and they start off their meal with Budweiser. We got a long way to go. We got a long way to go before people actually get that this is a problem. So when we talk about screening, I think one of the things that I really want to hit home to everyone is that screening involves, at least in, in my practice, in my office, everyone that comes in, it doesn't matter why you're there, 
will get a question sometime during the interview about alcohol consumption. If it's a woman who is pregnant, is a woman who's of childbearing age, a woman who's a grandmother, a woman who, uh, you know, a young girl who's maybe 13, 14, 15, we're going to have a pretty frank talk about alcohol. We're going to have a pretty frank talk about um, do they know anything about their prenatal history because that's what we need to be doing. It needs to be a question that everybody gets asked no matter what their socioeconomic status is, no matter where they come from, no matter what they do for a living, right? I've always said that alcohol is an equal opportunity teratogen, right? A teratogen is something that crosses the placental barrier and causes birth defects. That's what we're talking about here. That's what FAS is. It's an alcohol-related birth defect. We know what causes this. So everyone gets the same opportunity to have the same questions asked. That, to me, is the most important message about screening, is that we do not decide on the basis of socioeconomic status, geographical location, income, um, ethnic group, racial background. Everybody gets the same question because to me that's the most important thing. So we're going to talk a little bit about screening, certainly. We're going to talk a little bit about a whole bunch of stuff because frankly for me, um, with screening, uh, you have to understand what FASD is. If you don't understand what it is, you're not going to give yourself, you're not going to have the knowledge that you need to ask the right questions. And it's all about asking the right questions. For me, and I'll tell you right now, uh, my personal bias is not to hand out pages and pages and pages and pages of checklists and questionnaires. And, you know, because you know what? A lot of the people that I see can't read well enough to do those things. If I hand them a questionnaire and say, here you go, fill it out, and then I'll go through it and I'll look and go, <gasps> you know, Item 14 and a half point 2B talks about alcohol, but I've got someone who really can't read well enough to do that. What's the point of doing that questionnaire? It's a waste of paper, and not only that, it's a waste of that person's time. Right? This is about time. Time is of the essence. So I call this screening fitting the puzzle pieces together. Okay? And I have to give credit to my colleague on um, the Canadian Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Diagnostic Team, Steve Richardson, who's done a lot of the who's done a lot of the work for this particular presentation. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about characteristics. We're going to look at screening, okay? We're going to look at children versus adults because that's a whole other kettle of fish when you're talking about adults. I don't know whether you've been listening to the CBC uh, series in the morning on, on FAS diagnosis or FAS in adult populations, FAS period across the province. They were talking this morning about uh, a client um, who had been diagnosed as, a, as an adult, and that was one of my clients that I'd actually seen. But it took him a long, long time to negotiate and navigate himself through the various systems that he kept bumping into that kept reading him wrong. The problem with screening for FASD is you can impact, you touch the system in so many ways. That's cool. Sounds like something out of sonar. I don't know if anybody else can hear this on, a, on any of the other sites, but it sounds like we're in a submarine. This is so cool. Okay. Um, and I think maybe what needs to happen is somebody needs to mute their mic somewhere. Does that... Sounds like a toilet. Anyway. So this is what we're going to do. Hopefully there's not too much background noise. So we're going to talk about screening children versus adults, and then we're going to talk about intervention strategies, because that's why we screen. We screen to diagnose, we screen to figure out what the heck we're going to do with someone who's never fit anywhere that that person has happened to bump, right? They don't fit school, they don't fit family, they don't fit prison because they're often there, they don't fit child welfare intervention models, they don't fit the medical system, they just don't fit. So hopefully that's just something on our site. That's a very cool noise. I'm going to get so distracted. This is not so good. This is not good. Uh, okay. <clears throat> So I think what we will do, we'll start off with this. And I know everyone knows this. So I know the people in Nunavut know this, and I know the people that are on, uh, are watching this in, in Yellowknife and, and Northwest Territories know this, and I know the people in BC know it. But what I want you to do is think about this stuff from the point of view of framing a screening interview. Because that's what I want to teach you how to do. I don't want you to... 
Again, I don't want you to come out of this thinking, okay, this is the world's best screening tool and it's 22 and a half pages and I'm going to hand it out to everyone and it's going to give me everything I need to know because you're going to be so disappointed and it's not going to work. So what I'm going to do is walk you through some of the stuff, but what I want you to do is think about how you're going to frame an interview or client contact with someone that you suspect may have FAS or you're dealing with a family, how are you going to frame the questions that you're going to ask those caregivers so you go at the end of the interview, okay, my spidey senses are tingling. And that's basically what it goes down to for me. I'll interview and I'll go, oh, 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 and I'll just keep going through the interview and at the end of it I'll go, hmm, sounds a lot like, and for me, because of what I do as a living, I can say, Okay, we better, now I know where I'm going with my assessment. Now I know the tools I need to pull out. Now I know the questions I need to ask in, in more detail. Now I know how to frame the data I get. The thing is, you already know everything you need to know. You do. If you've been doing frontline work in any kind of human capacity, you know, working with clients in human relations, in, in corrections, in education, in social work, in any, in teaching, you know this population because you see them all the time. So my job is to give you the confidence and maybe some specific questions so you can go, okay, this is what I'm doing. It's not a simple case of handing out a checklist. Okay? There are checklists out there. I'm not going to say that they aren't and sometimes they're really helpful but frankly, again, for the population I see, their literacy skills are low. They can't read well enough to do that. And if I'm dealing with someone who's an adolescent or an adult, um, frankly, their support systems are so burned out and so exhausted by filling out reams and reams and reams of paper that nobody seems to pay any attention to. What I want to give them is an opportunity to tell their story. And in telling the story, I can ask questions to lead where the story goes, but in telling the story, I'm going to get what I need to be able to go, okay, this person needs to be seen. So screening for me is all about talking and very much about listening. Okay, it's about listening to what people are telling you because they will tell you very clearly that there's something wrong. They may not use the same language that I might use because I have a little bit more book stuff behind me. But they will tell me what it is that they need. They will tell me what their problems are. They will tell me how frustrated they are, they will tell me all of the ways that they've bumped into the systems and all of the ways that the systems have not necessarily recognized what the problems are and we will eventually get to the right spot. So it's about enhancing the knowledge that you've already got, building your capacity because frankly I think you already have it. You've got the capacity. You just have to think about things. So we're going to talk about some of the sensory perceptual things. Now for little kids we always ask sensory perceptual questions. You know, is this a little kid who is inappropriate in terms of the activity level? Are they either, you can't get them going with, with 9,000 volts, you know, a cattle prod wouldn't even get them go, mm. you know, they just don't blink, they don't move, they're unresponsive, right? Uh, or you've got the energizer buddy that you have to tie into a chair to get them to finish a meal, right? They just can't settle. So, here we go. These are all the ways that sensory perceptual issues can impact a young child. Think about this from a young child first, okay? Touch. Too reactive to touch. They either want too much, they're like stuck on you like a Velcro kid, or they don't want you to touch them at all. They just stiffen and scream when you come near. Um, they don't get things like hunger and cold. So this is, a, this is a little kid that in a day like this will be outside in a t-shirt and shorts and flip-flops if you let them. And you go, aren't you cold? No, I'm not cold. And yet in the summertime, they've got a hoodie and sweater and, you know, long sleeve shirt and pants and, you know, and boots. And they don't get hot and cold. Their body isn't reading the messages right. Their brain isn't filtering the information properly. Um, certain fabrics drive them crazy. One of the questions I'll always ask is, what do you do if there's um, a tag on the back of your shirt? And they just, oh, you know, and, they, and these are the kids that take the tags out of their shirts or their moms and dads take the tags out of their shirts before they even get them because they can't stand the feel of that or a, a seam in your, the toe of your sock. You know, that just drives some of these kids squirrely. Bright light. They can't stand bright light. Those are the kids that have their hoods up all the time. Aha! It's not just because they're difficult adolescents and they don't want to talk to you. It's because they can't screen out bright light. So they wear their hoods all the time or they wear hats all the time, right? 
because they can't take the light. Or they get really reactive to noise, right? They either have their iPods on and it's so loud that everybody can hear it on the bus, right? Or else they get into a noisy place and the first thing they do is they put their hands over their ears because they can't take it. These are the kids that when you try and take them to Galaxyland at West Edmonton, go berserk. Even though they want to be there, they can't stand it, right? So we're really familiar with asking these questions for little kids. We need to ask the same questions for adults. What if you do, what do you do if you're a hyper re if you're hyper reactive to noise and you're stuck in the remand center? It's never quiet in the remand center. Ever, ever, ever. And it's often very bright. When the lights are on, it's really, really bright. And what happens if you can't stand textures that are rough and scratchy and you've got those wonderful blue and orange jumpsuits on with Velcro? You don't even get a zipper or a button, you get Velcro. All of those textures are going to drive someone with FAS just crazy. They don't know that those things are bothering them, but they get irritable, they get cranky, they get short-tempered, right? They look like they're difficult, and what it is is they can't handle the sensory perception that's going on. They can't handle that stuff. So you need to be sensitive and think about asking questions like this to a grown-up. You don't have to ask them to a little kid. You ask them to a grown-up. You ask them to a 15-year-old. You ask them to someone in their 20s. So you still ask about the sensory perceptual problems because guess what? They're still there. Except by the time they're adults, what usually happens is they've developed some really maladaptive coping strategies, um, like what we call the marijuana maintenance program, because that just kind of numbs everything down and you're not so reactive. Right? So you end up involved in things like substances, alcohol, all kinds of nasty stuff, so that you don't feel how rough and scratchy your environment is. Right? So think about those things. Challenges with planning are huge. These, this is a crew that doesn't plan. When you're five, it doesn't matter. That's why you have grown-ups. Grown-ups are supposed to plan, right? And even when you're 12 and 13, grown-ups are sort of supposed to plan. But by the time you're 13, you're supposed to kind of, sort of, kind of, kind of, sort of get it on your own and start planning actively. Like, oh, I really want to go to Jessica's house, so that means I have to do my homework ahead of time. And Oh, all right. But what happens if you can't plan? And what happens if that lovely little spot in the front of your brain called your frontal lobes, where all your executive skills tend to reside, what happens if those haven't come on stream yet and you're still 16 and you still really want to go to Jessica's house but you haven't done your homework? Well, you're not going to think about your homework. You're going to go to Jessica's house and then you won't understand why the teacher's mad at you or your parents are mad at you because you didn't, you know, you can see how it goes, right? So we know that people like this are impulsive. They live in the moment. They don't plan. If they plan one day ahead of the one, one day at a time, I'm happy. I've got people who plan like five minutes, if that. They they can't even plan five minutes ahead of the time. Horrible problems with time, right? You miss appointments. You don't show up. You forget that you've got them. Uh, you show up a day late. You say, oh yeah, it was 9:30, but yeah, one o'clock. They won't mind. They won't mind if I'm there. So this. This poor time concept one is the one that drives helping agencies bananas. You are supposed to be here for your parenting assessment at 9.30 in Dr. Massey's office and you missed it. That means you are uncooperative and you don't care about your kids. No, it actually means you can't plan and you don't have any sense of time. So somebody has to help that person get to the assessment or the appointment. It means that if you've got an appointment with your doctor and you miss it, there are a lot of a lot of clinics now that just say you miss an appointment that's it you're done or you miss an appointment you pay us 50 bucks and then maybe we'll rebook you now if you're impoverished if you have no money that means you don't get medical care you just don't get medical care so these are people that tend to do thing by do things by rote they learn a way of doing it and they just do it and they do it and they do it and they do it and if it doesn't work or it's not effective we just do it and we do it and we do it because that's what we know. We know how to do this and we know how to do it this way and for crying out loud don't ask us to change. Right? So there's lots of problems with transitions. And complex tasks, multi-step directions, oh that won't work. Memory and learning. Okay, We think that memory and learning is an issue for children in school. It's an issue for all of us all the time. You have to be able to remember things so that you can look like you know what you're doing. If you're a parent, you have to remember to get the kid's bathing suit to school on swimming day. 
You have to remember to make sure the homework gets back. You have to make sure that there's a lunch ready. Uh, all of this stuff involves memory and learning, and this is really hard for people who are impacted by alcohol. They don't remember, and when they do remember, it's really inconsistent. So it's there today, it's gone tomorrow, but it shows up two weeks later and you go, what the heck, where did that come from? Well, I don't know, it just popped into my head and that's pretty well what it is. It just popped into their head, so blah, there it is. Now the problem is, if you spit something out at exactly the right time, it's going to make you sound like you know what you're doing. And you don't. It was a happy accident that you said it at the right time. You didn't mean to say it at the right time, and we all go, oh, isn't that wonderful learning? They got it. No, they didn't. They just said it. And we all go, oh, that's great. And they get rewarded and we all feel good. And then they forget to follow through on it. And then we get mad at them. Right? So you can see how the pattern kind of builds. The other thing we have to talk about with memory and learning for this particular population, it's not so much a problem with memory sometimes as it is a problem with forgetting. These are individuals who have what we call impaired forgetting. They don't remember to forget stuff. You no longer need to remember the name of your third year, third grade teacher when you're my age. It's, it's nice if you can, just in case you bump into her in the grocery store, but you don't really need it. What you do need to remember is that don't talk to this person because every time you do, you end up going out drinking with them and then you get in trouble. That's what you should remember, not Mrs. McGillicuddy, right? That doesn't matter. So the problem is you often have a head full of useless stuff. And if you've grown up in a family, for example, a lot of the kids that I see have been placed in adoptive families. They grow up in families where talking and communication and warmth and counseling and all of this stuff is done a lot. So they have a head full of terms, but they can't use them. And it sets them up to fail because they can talk, well, we say they can talk the talk, but they can't walk the walk. They can talk about it, but they can't do it, right? If you've had enough um, insight-oriented therapy, you could probably stand up and, and do a really good insight-oriented counseling intervention if you're FAS because you have all the terms. The thing is you can't apply any of it. Insight is not big in this population usually. Uh, and usually the insight is something like, boy, am I in trouble now. Yep, that you're in trouble now. That's kind of what the insight is. So the insight-oriented stuff usually just sets you up to fail. I mean, my classic example is my poor little guy who, who, would, who would always start off, no matter who he met, the new professional he'd meet would, would, the first thing he'd say is, I have real problems with cause and effect reasoning. Right? And it made him sound like he had some insight into the fact that he had cause, no cause and effect reason, but he didn't. If you looked at what he did, you could see he had no insight into what he did because he just kept doing the same old things. He'd heard it from judges and lawyers and prison officials and, you know, AA and NA and ADAC, and he'd heard this over and over and again. So he just put it into part of his terminology of things to throw out to people when he gets into trouble, but he really doesn't understand what it means, okay? So think about memory and learning. Information process, oh well, we know all of this stuff. Okay, challenges, consequences, longer processors. These people tend to be really impulsive, but take a long time to think about things. So when your mouth and your hands are busy, but your brain is about a half a mile behind, by the time the brain goes, oh, n oh, um, don't, don't do that. It's too late. It's been done. Or it's been said. And then you're in trouble again. So there's that weird combination of impulsivity and very slow processing that again gets these people into trouble. You need to ask them specific questions about, okay, how quickly do you do things? Did anybody ever say you were hyper when you were a little kid? Oh yeah, I was really hyper when I was a little kid. And then you ask things like, well, did you ever fall out of a tree? Chuh, of course. You know, fall off the garage roof. You know, do your, you know, take your bike down a hill and try and crash it deliberately? Yeah, those are all the kinds of impulsive things that we ask about. Um, so we, we always ask specific questions. Ever do something impulsively, like your friend says, go in the, to the 7-Eleven store and, you know, take a pack of smokes and, yeah, and just take a pack of smokes. And they go, oh, cool, yeah. And they go off and do that. That's impulsivity. That impulsivity gets you into trouble with the police, though. But by the time you figure out you shouldn't be doing that, it's too late. You've already done it. You've done it. So, and then we have the lovely confabulation. Confabulation is not the same as lying, okay? Lying is when you deliberately know what the truth is. 
and then you try and change or manipulate the truth so that the consequences are not negative or immediate. Immediately negative, let's put it like that. Confabulation is when you can't remember anything and you just fill in the gaps because people keep asking you. Right? That's confabulation. That's what gets a lot of our guys and our women into trouble with the law because they want people to like them and they will tell stories as long as somebody's asking them questions. And, you know, when you get into trouble with officer friendly, officer friendly will often, you know, you get a drink of water, you sit in a warm room, you maybe have a cup of coffee too. So the longer you tell stories to officer friendly when you're doing an interview, the more coffee you get. Hey, win-win. So they're, they're, just, they're going to agree to all kinds of things. Whether or not they've done them, they're going to agree to them. They have a real hard time being able to distinguish what really happened versus what they think happened versus what they saw on TV last week. It all gets wrapped up into a very messy picture. So we have huge problems with exploitation, as you already know. Social exploitation, sexual exploitation, financial, um, huge, huge problems with that. And employment uh, exploitation as well. <coughs> so I think we'll go through this. This is abstract thinking and judgment. We already know that that's not going to be there. Behavioral regulation is a huge problem. Remember, you're thinking about all of these things, and you're thinking about them from the point of view of asking questions. It doesn't matter how big or little your pers the person is that you're dealing with. You're going to ask them about anger. You're going to ask them about mood swings. There's, there's a lot of people, I think, with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder that have probably been misdiagnosed bipolar because they talk about their moods swinging, because their moods do swing independent on what's going on around them. If, if everyone around them is happy and calm, chances are they're happy and calm. If someone loses it, that's who they're going to be, right? I call that being a social chameleon. You are who you're with. And if the people that you're with are up and down, you're up and down too. If your life is crazy, you're transient, you haven't got any money, you're addicted to substances, you're going to have mood swings. So you ask the standard psychiatric interview and talk about mood swings, and they go, well, yeah, but you have to ask why, right? Ask why. It's not a simple case. Now, that doesn't mean people with FASD don't have bipolar disorder, because they can have anything, right? They can have anything. Impulsivity, compulsivity, you get stuck on stuff. You're either inattentive or you can't switch. This is the video game stuff. And for video games, after you grow up, what do you, what do you get yourself hooked on? VLTs and gambling. That's the grown-up version of a video game, right? So lots and lots of problem gambling, lots of frustration, lots of tantrums, lots of aggression. You can still have a tantrum, technically, and be over the age of five. If you've ever seen someone who just blows for no reason or something so, so tiny, that's still a tantrum behavior. But when they're an adult and they're tantruming, we call that aggression, right? And sometimes we call it targeted aggression. So you have to be really careful. So affect is usually really flat, or else it's all over the place, really labile. So you can bounce around. Your moods can be all over the place. You're happy one moment. You're crying the next. Or else you're just mm, blunt. Nothing bothers you. Nothing phases you. Um, distractibility. You act without thinking. You can't say why you've done it. I remember um, Mary Berube when we were used to be doing training at the very first, uh, when we were starting FAS training uh, throughout the province, and she and Donna DeBolt were the, were the people that would come in for children's services and do training. And, and what she always said, and I think it's true, was if you ask a person with FAS why they did something, you deserve any answer you get. They don't know why they do it. They just do it. And to say why? Well, that's just the dumbest question in the world. So you don't ask why. You might ask someone who was there why, but you're not going to ask that person because why is really hard. What is OK? Who is sometimes OK? Why? No. Why won't work? Why is an abstract question. And our crew, by and large, tend to be very concrete individuals. They're stuck in the here and now, and they're stuck in the moment, and they're stuck in the physical, right? They never get into the mental part. They're stuck in their physical body, and that's what they think about, and that's how they process everything. So they don't know why they do things. And our whole system of justice is built around, well, why did you do that? I don't know. Because it was, you know, it's because it was there. I don't know. They don't know why. Um, so there's lots and lots of problems. 
you get stuck on stuck. No inhibition. Inhibition is a good thing, right? Regardless of what you see in Girls Gone Wild and crazy stuff like that. Inhibition is good. You should keep your clothes on in public. You shouldn't really talk to people you don't know. You shouldn't make provocative statements uh, to strangers. You know, there's a lot of shoulds that are actually very protective. Our population tend not to get that you shouldn't do things. They go out and do them. And the more craziness you see on TV, the more likely they are to emulate it because it's on TV, right? If it's on TV, it must be true. You know, if you read it in the paper, it's got to be true. And, and it's the same thing. If, if I see it on TV, therefore, somebody must think that that's an okay thing to do, so I'll go out and do it. So lots and lots of problems with social skills and sexuality and doing the right stuff. Now, we don't, I'm not going to talk about these, except to say that all of the secondary characteristics develop because of that chronic poor fit. They don't fit where they are. They're, they don't fit in school. You know, often they don't fit in their families. That's a very scary thing. If you don't fit in your family, that's the only place that you usually have. And what was, who was it that said, definition of family is where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in, right? That's, that's family. They, they don't have that. They don't have that source of support. They don't fit within a family. They don't fit within the school system. They don't fit in the world of work. They don't fit often in a larger context of peer relationships, appropriate peer relationships. Uh, they don't even fit in prison, right? No, well, they, they're there, but they don't fit there, right? And the problem is because you have to kind of get the pecking order in prison. You have to get the rules. They're often unspoken until you transgress them and then you get pounded. But everything is all very subtle and a lot of stuff is nonverbal and a lot of stuff is just kind of, you know, you have to be wary. You have to be watchful. If you have problems processing nonverbal information, which a lot of our people do, you do not fit within the correction system. You're always in trouble there too because you don't get it there any more than you get it any other place. So you tend to really be in trouble. This last one here, you appear not to care. That's really bad when you get into trouble. If you appear not to care about what you have done or what you have been involved in, we call that lack of remorse. Lack of remorse has some pretty negative consequences when you're involved in the justice system. I just did, uh, not just, but about six months ago, I was involved in a, in a criminal trial for an individual who was fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, right? And the thing that the police and the Crown Prosecutor just couldn't understand is why, when he found out that the person that he'd stabbed like 27 times at the bus stop in front of 40 people had just died, well, he did a pretty good job on him. Um, why his question was, okay, well, I think my brother's in jail. Could you look up and find out where he is, and then maybe we can spend time together? Now, if you understand the world of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, that is a perfectly normal question. Well, okay, so I'm now he's dead, so I know I'm going to go away, so let's maybe I can end up spending some time with my brother, because I know he's in there too. Oh, good, this is win-win. You know, he, he was, and, and to him that made perfect sense, but that was something that the Crown Prosecutor and the police just went, he has no remorse. He doesn't care. And the thing is, he, it wasn't that he didn't care. It was, that was yesterday. That was four weeks ago. That was, you know, that was before. And now this is now. So it wasn't that he didn't care. It was that he really is psychologically incapable of understanding the consequences of what he's done but it makes him look like a really, really bad guy. Because you're supposed to go, <gasps> you know, and have this big show of emotion, and you know, I probably would do that if I was in that situation, but he just couldn't do that. His affect didn't allow him to do that. He couldn't do it. So one of the things that I had to do is find a good reason for why he asked that very strange question. And to me, I said, well, that was yesterday. He's processing things right now. He's living in the moment. It's not that he doesn't care about this person, but that person is no longer in his world, so I have no time. They're gone. They're not in front of me anymore, so I don't see them. So you have to kind of think very creatively. So here we go. Now, if you're a frontline worker, these are the things that you are now going to be seeing. Isolation, depression, self-destructive behavior, suicidal ideation, or attempts. 
okay? Aggression, truancy, running away, inappropriate sexual behavior. These are the questions you need to ask. When you're dealing with an adult, when you're dealing with an older teen, these are the questions you need to ask. When you actually you start dealing with children in school, like 10, 11, you can, you can ask about depression. These kids are sad. When they're little, they're sad. They often don't know they're sad. If you ask them questions, they go, I'm fine, I'm happy. But when you look at how they function, they're, they're unhappy little people. They may not have the language to be able to tell you how unhappy they are, but they're unhappy. And you watch from what they do, and you watch how they isolate themselves, and they don't feel good in their own skins. They start getting self-destructive. Right? Picking the wrong friends is a classic. And it's not so much picking a friend, it's you end up where people will accept you. Our crew, because they have a chronic poor fit in school, tend to end up with what I call the lowest common denominator in social groups. You end up with the people who also have problems, <coughs> who will accept you no matter who you are or what you do, because guess what? They're outcasts too. They're not the kids who are captains of the basketball team and you know, are in the IB program and you know, in the Mensa society. Um, they're not doing that. They're out with the kids that are smoking cigarettes behind the, behind the school shed at eight because you go where you're wanted. You go where you're accepted. So you need to be asking questions about things like this. Truancy, I've had kids as young as five try and run away. Where are you going? I'm just going. I'm just going. Um, and sometimes they're going from a place that probably isn't safe, but sometimes they're just going because they go. They get mad and they take off and they go. Um, the inappropriate sexual behavior is such a huge problem. <coughs> For a lot of the women that I see who are vulnerable, uh, needy, have huge issues with abandonment, they end up, they often end up in the sex trade, right? That doesn't mean every, every young woman involved in the sex trade is FAS, but everyone that I've seen in the sex trade has been FAS, some form of FAS, some form, because you're easily exploited. So you have problems with that. One of the things that I'd really like to do is be able to, you know, and I've done a little bit of this already, but, but work with some of the kids in safe houses and see just exactly what the incidence level of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is in that population. Because I can tell you if I bump into them somewhere along the system and if they've managed to get out, I can, I'll ask them about sex trade experience and a lot of them have had it. And they just get out because, I don't know, they kind of fall out of it they end up in a safe house or they get apprehended and placed in care or someone comes in and takes them back home and they, or they get out of drugs sometimes. But inappropriate sexual behavior and sex trade activity is huge, huge. Um, and sometimes I've got young women and young men who are so vulnerable they don't even, uh, they don't even know you can charge for it. Not that I think working in the sex trade is competitive employment, but I mean, they, they don't even get that. That's how vulnerable they are. So it's huge. Lots and lots of problems. If you're in any of the helping professions, mental health issues, you see these people. They present in crisis all the time. Their lives are one crisis after another. Lots of justice issues. They're either a victim or a perpetrator, or sometimes both. Um, usually not at the same time. Lots of problems with substance abuse. Lots of problems with disrupted education. Lots of involuntary confinement, okay? YAC, Youth Assessment Centers in, in Alberta. They're in Yellowhead Youth Center. They're in Edmonton Young Offenders Center when they're young. Um, they're in secure treatment facilities. They're, and when they get older, they end up in the prison system or they end up in Alberta Hospital or some place where they are confined because they cannot function on their own. That's the bottom line. This is a population that tends to not be able to function on their own. So they bump into systems that are supposed to provide supports, but the way our systems all work is they work on the sense of self-actualization and self-realization. Eventually we will help you and you will go, aha, there will be that wonderful moment and you go, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going there anymore. I'm not hanging around with this person anymore. I know what I need to do to get myself out of this situation, right? Our services are short term. They're designed to teach people what they need to know and then to back off. That's how it's supposed to go. The problem is, once you back off from our population, 
they're in crisis again because they didn't have the ability to learn what it was they needed to learn so that when you eventually pull back the services, they can function on their own. They can't function on their own. That's the problem. They don't function well by themselves. But when you're an adult, over 18, you're supposed to be independent. You're supposed to be able to do this stuff. And when you can't do this stuff, the consequences are pretty immediate and pretty punitive. You get yourself <coughs> into really big trouble. There you go. Nothing replaces a good interview. Ta-da! That's the bottom line. For me, that's what it's all about. Uh, I know that there's some screening documents out there, but remember, I'm dealing with a population that has limited literacy skills. Limited literacy skills. They can't read the questions. Anything more than one page is too much. It's too much. They can't do it. They've had questionnaire after questionnaire after questionnaire, and the problem is nobody sits and looks at why those problems are happening. Right? I get people in my office, especially when they're older, older adolescents or adults, and they'll come in. I just got another referral the other day. We have four psychiatric assessments, four assessments through the school system, one from a hospital site, and we still haven't figured out what the problem is. And when I talk to the individual who's referring this, this is coming through Alberta uh, Employment, Immigration, and Industry. Thank you, Alberta Employment, Immigration, and Industry. Um, there's a little, th this is a really, really with it career consultant. So this young man comes in Matt just like, Ugh. he's so mad. He's angry all the time. He's just furious at everybody. Um, and he comes in with his mom, and he's 19 or 20. That's not a typical thing for a 19 or 20-year-old to do. So he comes in with mom. Mom says, we just can't get along, and he's not, you know, and, and the standard, you know, he's, you know, it's always about employment when you're dealing with someone with Alberta employment industry and immigration. So the question is always employment. But the career consultant said, well, tell me a little bit about his background. She said, well, you know, he was adopted. And there was something in the history about being affected by alcohol or being exposed to alcohol in utero. So how many, four psychiatric referrals, four assessments through the school system, one from a hospital and one from a private psychologist, and nobody went, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This piece of information over here, the birth mom, you know, drinking and using substances during the pregnancy, this little bit here explains all this stuff over here. To me, it just makes sense. If we had listened to mom the first time around when this little guy bumped into the school system and didn't fit when he was five or six, we could have saved all the other stuff all the way along because we would have known what we're dealing with. Very, very rarely do I see someone that comes in and that's not been mentioned somewhere. I will go through reports from other, other people in my profession and it's written right there in the background information. But they don't link it to anything that's going on. Why not? Why not? That's the tip of the iceberg that we have to get professionals to think about. That's not just a little bit of interesting information like his eyes were blue and his mom drank like a fish in pregnancy, right? It's a little more important than that. It's like, whoa, yes, his eyes are blue, that's lovely, he's got beautiful blue eyes. However, his behavior is completely off the wall and he's not learning in school and, that, you know, he tried to set fire to the cat and that kind of stuff. We need to pay attention to the information that's already there. Okay? Nothing replaces a good interview. I will give out checklists, yes, absolutely. But I know how to interpret what I get because I've done a good interview. I've talked about sensory perceptual issues. I've talked about medical history. Okay? Has this kid had a head injury? Because a lot of the kids are adults. We've seen if you're, if you're taking risks and you're impulsive and you jump off the barn roof or you think you can fly because you're Superman, you're going to whack yourself in the head. If you're stealing cars and rolling them, you're going to whack yourself in the head. So we ask about head injuries. We ask about other significant medical problems. We ask everything. I don't want a person to come out of my office and think, 
boy, she's not very noisy, nosy, is she? I mean, they all think I'm really nosy, and I say that. You know, I'm going to ask you a whole bunch of questions, and it's going to sound like I'm really nosy, and I am. I'm really nosy because I want to find out what your life has been like. Because if I don't ask the questions, I can't put it together. And to me, I, I guess because I've done this for so long now, I just know how to start. And I know how to ask the questions. And if I have a birth mom, I will ask the birth mom. Always ask the birth mom questions about alcohol and drug use. Always. And you have to be really, I don't want to say devious, because that implies you're doing this being sneaky. It's not, you have to be really persistent. Last week I had a little 18-year-old in my office, and I'm doing a parenting assessment, and I go, oh, for crying out loud, how old is your oldest child? Four. You do the math, okay? Her first baby, when she was 14, she was pregnant at 13, had the baby at 14. Okay, that's, that's even for my office, that's a bit young, okay? Um, so, any alcohol, you know, where you, you know, you're 13, what do you know? Were you drinking? No, not at all. Oh, oh so how did you find out you were pregnant? Well, me and my friend were really drunk, and so we went to the 7-Eleven and we bought pregnancy, you know, tests, and then I found out I was pregnant. Were you drinking? No, but I was really drunk when I found out I was pregnant. So then we just go backwards. So how many times, you know, like when you found out, like when did you start partying? Oh, 11. When did you find out you were pregnant? Well, I was like, I just thought I was getting really fat and I didn't feel very good and I was throwing up a lot. And so now I have a history where this child, this four-year-old, was probably exposed to utero, is exposed to alcohol in utero for the first two trimesters. Because she's 14. What 14-year-old gets being pregnant? What 14-year-old knows their body? They just, that, they just don't get it. So she didn't even know that she was, you know, it wasn't that she was getting fat. It was she was, she was pregnant. And she was barfing not because she was eating popcorn all the time, which is what she thought. She was barfing because she had morning sickness. So she didn't figure it out until she was probably about five and a half months pregnant. And in that meantime, she was partying hard every weekend. So now we flag that other little four-year-old and we watch her. We watch that four-year-old because we know there may be problems. But if we don't know, then we're never going to ask. And that four-year-old may look like a kid who's impulsive and ADHD and just difficult to deal with. And, you know, and because that child is not living with, with mommy anymore, is living with daddy, how quickly is daddy going to get frustrated and just say, I can't do this anymore? And, you know, and, and then we lose this little one. And then we end up with another one who has a baby at 14 or 15. Right? The cycle repeats itself. So the interview is crucial. The interview is crucial. You have to ask questions. You have to be prepared to ask difficult questions. And you ask them in a respectful way. This is not about you know, making somebody feel worse than they, than they might feel already. This is about what are we going to do. You can't do this anymore. With bio moms, that's a huge issue. I mean, I've had, I've had really painful conversations with biological moms about alcohol and drug use in pregnancies. And you have to do it. You have to learn how to do it. And you have to do it in a way that isn't going to turn them off and go, well, of course I didn't do that because that's the wrong thing to do. Because uh, everybody knows, most people know, it's the wrong thing to do. So if they are drinking, they're not necessarily going to tell you. But you have to ask. Uh, one of the most difficult cases we ever did in uh, when I was involved with the Lakeland Center for FAS was this oh, just sweet, absolutely sweet young woman, late twenties, gone to school, college degree, just you know, great kid. And she had this little guy who was as cute as a button, but like Damien from whatever that movie is, was it The Omen or The Demon, or whatever it is, this kid was just like, whoa, you, you just couldn't, he was so volatile and so disruptive and so difficult. And the story came out with this young woman that what had happened is she'd gone to college and had been really stressed and, and had just stopped 
menstruating. Her periods had stopped for a whole year because she was so stressed. This is the first time she'd been away from home. She was just having a horrible time. <sighs> she goes back home. Everything regulates itself. Woohoo. She goes back to finish her college program. It stops again. But this time it stopped because she was pregnant. And at that point she was working in a bar. But she just figured it's stress. But it wasn't. She was pregnant and she was drinking. And so this little guy, and this could have been any one of us, any one of the women in that room, that could have been us. Because we just recognize that pattern of binge drinking that we do when we're in university and college. It could have happened to any one of us. And this little guy did get a diagnosis. He got a diagnosis. And that was one of the hardest ones we've ever had to deliver because it, it was so much, we could have been there. You know, somebody could have been sitting across from us and giving us the same information. There but for the grace of God, basically. Right. I just did another one maybe a couple of months ago, the same situation. Bright, articulate, college-educated mom doing all the right things, just, you know, just a really decent mom, two great kids. The oldest one is the child from hell, not because she's an awful kid, but because she just doesn't respond the way the other kids do. She can't, her parenting techniques that work fine with the other ones don't work with this one at all. And she's just reached the point where she can't function anymore, she calls in children's services. She says, help, I don't know what I'm doing. This kid is violent because this kid is violent, throws rages uh, through her little sister down the stairs. I, yeah, I mean like really, when she blows, she blows. Broke her dad's nose. Dad was trying to restrain her. She headbutted him and broke his nose. Uh, and this is a big girl. I wouldn't want to have to kind of wrestle her to the floor if she was mad. Um, so we do the interview. And in the interview, what comes up is this is first baby, born when mom was very young. Mom was 15. Um, mom didn't know that she was pregnant for a long, long time. This is not the dad of this older child. Um, so a lot of, bit, a lot of uh, emphasis was placed on things like alienation and attachment and all that lovely stuff. Uh, and really what it turned out is that this mom was very young. This mom was partying because, you know, this is rural Alberta. Hey, it's what we do. You know, we don't all go to our library cards and go to the library on Friday night. We go out to a bush party. Uh, and so she was out drinking and carrying on and partying because she's 15. And that's what you do when you're 15. And woohoo, she's at a party. She gets really, really loaded. She gets sexually assaulted. So she's pregnant. She doesn't know she's pregnant because she wasn't expecting, you know, you can just see how it goes. So guess what? You do the interview, you find out. And I said, you know what? I think this explains all the other stuff that's been going on for years and years and years. Why your interventions haven't worked, why none of the interventions anybody else has tried hasn't worked, why this child is doing so poorly in school, why she has problems with her peers, why she's, you know, she's got all the typical diagnoses of attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, reactive attachment disorder, you name it. She's got them all. But you know what she actually has? She's probably got FASD. Because mom told me, yep, this is what was going on. I pulled the notice of birth from the hospital with mom's permission. It's right there. Which is very rare, I must say to actually have written confirmation of alcohol consumption on a notice of birth. And I said, you know what? I think this is what we need to do. And she just went, oh. I said, I'm not saying this to make it worse than it already is. I'm not saying this so that you will blame yourself more. But if we don't call it what it might be and we don't do the right things, we're going to lose this little girl. Right? It's not about you feeling okay or even me feeling okay because frankly these interviews are really really hard to do really hard to do very painful very tough so when you do this kind of frontline work you have to have really good coping skills and a really good support system and a really sick sense of humor okay i usually start off and say you know i have a really black sense of humor i've been doing this stuff for almost 20 years okay and very little surprises me anymore. Everything bothers me. Everything bothers me. But I cover it up with a very sick sense of humor because I have to laugh. If I don't laugh, I'm going to spend all my day bawling. I'm going to cry all the time because 
people's lives are painful. And this mom that I had to talk with, that was so painful. I could just hear her go, I could just hear her shrink on the other end of the phone. Because we'd done a case conference. I didn't bring this up when we were talking with Children's Services. Where I said, you know what? I didn't want to do it in front of everybody. You and I needed to have this conversation on our own. But this is what I think you need to do. And she just, I could just hear her crumble. Just crumble. And she said, oh God. And I said, you didn't know. You didn't know. Nobody does this on purpose. Nobody does this and doesn't care. You were a child. You didn't know. So now what we have to do is make sure your child is okay. And I mean, Lord love her. She phoned me a week later and she said, I'm filling out the forms for the diagnostic center. And, it's, and this is a, this is a well-educated mom who has really good skills. And she said, it's so long and it's so complicated. I just can't do it. I can't do this. And I said, you know what? Send them in anyway. And let someone from there help you with this stuff. You are not doing this by yourself anymore. You can't do it by yourself. She'd been trying to do it by herself for years. And this is not a family problem, right? This is a community problem. You know, there's that classic line, I think Hillary Clinton stole it from somebody, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it does. It takes the whole community to raise someone that's been affected by alcohol in utero. Because no one person, no one family can do this on their own. If you think you can, you're going to get real tired and real burned out, and you're not going to make it. As a caregiver, as a family, as a frontline worker, you can't do it. So nothing replaces the good interview. The good interview is what you really need to do. There are, as I said, you can give a Connor's behavior checklist. You can get a child. You can give out a ch children's behavior checklist. You can give out ADHD questionnaires. You can give out question questionnaires on development. Guess what? You can give out paper until it's this thick. But if you don't know how to think about the information that you're given in those pieces of paper, it will make no difference. The crucial bit of information, the thing that has to be done one to one, is sitting down and talking either with a bio family or the adoptive family or the caregivers or someone who intimately knows that person and having the tough conversation. To me, that's screening. That's screening. Because if we just start handing out questionnaires or do the other thing, which is what um, certainly has been talked about in some places, meconium screening at birth, right? They just screen meconium um, or hair samples because that will tell whether the child has been exposed to alcohol in the last, I don't know how, I'm not even sure exactly what the parameters of that are. There's a, there's a place for that. My concern with that is it leaves the mom out of the question. And moms are who we're dealing with. My job, the way I see my job, is to make sure that we have lots and lots and lots of healthy babies. I love babies. I think babies are great. I want healthy babies, right? I want healthy babies. So I want moms to be part of the picture. I don't ever want moms to be left out of the picture. And I think if we just do a lot of prenatal screening, it might give us an incident and prevalence level, but it's never gonna do anything so we can actually intervene on a case-by-case -case basis with moms because I want healthy, healthy families and I want healthy babies and I want healthy communities. I'm really selfish. In another 10 years, maybe I'll be doing, I don't know what, maybe I'll just be working with people with autism. That would be okay. And I'm not gonna, you know, I mean, not that that's, not that I don't wanna work with this population, but I don't want, I want it to be rare rather than, okay, here we go again, same old, same old. I don't want that anymore. So for me, the interview is absolutely crucial. And I've talked a little bit about with this, uh, with this already, especially when we're talking about adults. Um, this is not a fault, okay? We have to look at things like supports for the individuals that we work with. And we have to screen the supports. If we're asking questions for support services, then we're going to be asking, we're going to be able to figure out, okay, what does this community need? This is all about community development and family development. Yes, it's about the person that's alcohol affected, but it's about community development. How do we provide the right kinds of support so this community can get itself healthy or this family can get itself healthy?
or this town can get itself healthy. So we have to look at supports. We have to look at providing the right kind of services. I really, you know, if I had a magic wand, what I would invent is a series of grandmas. I just have grandmas. I have grandmas all over the place. I just have fly-in grandmas. And the fly-in grandmas would basically go, OK, I'm here. <coughs> I'm never going to go away. I will do what needs to be done for this family, for this community, for wherever. And I'm never going to go away. And I'm always going to be here. And I'm just going to do what has to be done. I'm going to go in and provide day-to-day -day support. I'm going to provide care. I'm going to provide modeling of what needs to happen. And I'm not going to get mad at the person if they don't pick it up. I'm just going to be there. That's my job. I am the grandma. you know. And I would love to be able to do that. I was working with um, Métis Child and Family Services for a while in the city, and we were actually trying to do that. We were trying to get a series of homes with gookums, with grandmas who were never going to go away. And it didn't matter about you know, what mom was doing or dad was doing. What mattered was that the family was together, whatever that looked like. The family was together, and the kids were safe. And the parents were safe. And there was modeling, and there was love, and there was constructive criticism, and there was good communication. But the services never disappeared just because it was the end of the six-month TGO. The services were always there because that was, that was going to be what was needed. We know that FASD is a lifelong problem. That's why we're talking about it. It's not like it ever goes away. It just changes a little bit, but the basic questions are always the same. Okay, So we have to build resources that don't disappear when funding disappears. We need services. You know, There's a wonderful program at Catholic Social Services called the Step-by-Step -Step Program. I love the people there. I love Dorothy Henneveld, who runs it. I love all her staff. I love what they do. It drives me crazy, and Dorothy crazy too, that they've got a three-year three -year mandate. Right? The step-by-step -step program is for parents that are alcohol affected, and chances are their children are too, but they've only got three years. When we know intuitively that three years is not enough, it needs to be 10 years. It needs to be as long as that person needs the support. The support is there. So I would love to see continued funding for agencies like that and other agencies that operate like that where we have ongoing support and we don't pull it away at the end of the mandate just because they think we think they should have learned it all in three years. But if you're 43 and you still haven't learned the basics, what's to say you're going to learn them by the time you're 46 because you've had 43 years to learn them already and you still haven't gotten it? It doesn't make sense. We provide the support that needs to be there. And here's another one. Adequate supports today may be inadequate tomorrow. Just because you think you've got it figured out this week doesn't mean the wheels are going to fall off everything and you're going to have to go in and do something else next week. For adolescents, that's critical, absolutely critical. Uh, for kids in that horrible time between 12 and 13, uh, you know, when they're 12, they're usually in grade 6 and things are okay and we know they don't think and we give them lots of structure and we just tell them how to do things and there's lots of TAs and then, whoa, they're 13 and they go to junior high and we expect that they've learned it all. Junior high is usually where all <coughs> hell breaks loose for my population that I see because that's the time when we figure, well, we've held their hands for six years, they need to be doing this. And so, you know, how are we ever going to know if they've learned it if we don't give them a chance to try it? Well, for me, chance to try is chance to fail. Don't do it. Okay? Keep that level of support. Anytime there's a transition, plan for it. Please, dear God, plan for it. Because, that's a, and that's another question you ask in an interview, what happens during transitions? People are going to go, oh, well, <laughs> Well, let me tell you what happened when they went from junior high to high school, or let me tell you what happened when they went from grade one to grade two. And it, let me tell you what happened when I tried to get them off the video, you know, the computer game yesterday. A transition tends to be a very difficult time for people that are alcohol affected. They get stuck. They get perseverative. They can't shift. They get locked into one way of doing something or one way of thinking, and they can't 
figure it out. They just can't change it. So things are always going to change. You have to continually be thinking on your feet. Okay? Screening. Kids and adults. Well, easy. What's the, what's the first thing that comes in to the office with a child? The child doesn't come in on their own, do they? Well, they shouldn't. But sometimes they do. Um, there's always a whole crew of grown-ups that come with them. You ask the grown-ups what's going on. You watch the child, you observe the child, you ask the child. But you talk to the grown-ups. That's the interview. Talk to the grown-ups. And not only talk to them, listen to what they have to say. Never be rushed on the interview. Okay? Now I know for some people you only get, what, half an hour to do an intake interview? If that, you've got a caseload of gazillions and you have to get through them all and you've got like 15 minutes. If you can, give them more time. They have a lifetime of pain they have to tell you. And don't sell them short. Because in that storytelling, in that conversation that you're going to have, you'll get all the information you need and more for your screening. So that's what a screening is for me. Face-to-face -face contact, not paper, not pencils. My clients have seen that way too much, and they just go, oh, you've got more forms? And I'll go, yeah, we've got forms, but we're doing them after we've talked. Okay, we're not doing them first. We're doing them after because I want to spend some time talking with you, and then we'll see. Because by the time, off, you know, if it's an adolescent or an adult, and, and a parent comes in, which right there is a red flag, you know, if a parent comes in with a 40-year-old adult, I go, that's not... That's not typically normal, okay, you should be able to do this on your own, but they just go, oh, this one, I've done this about 15 times. They say, yeah, yeah, we'll do it later. If we need to do it at all, we'll do it later, right? They want to talk. They are so isolated. They're so alienated. They're so afraid they're going to be blamed because they've been blamed all the way along. It's always been their fault. It's that classic thing, you know, we used to say that autism was caused by the refrigerator mothers. Right? I don't know if you know the term refrigerator mothers, the cold and rigid mothers who didn't know how to bond with their children and that's why they had autism. Well, we're smarter now. We know that's not true. But we still do a lot of blaming and shaming when we're talking about kids with FAS. Right? And it's, and it's even worse with a biological mom. They are burdened with such unbelievable guilt that you give them a piece of paper and it's just they just go, oh, you know, another one that didn't get it. So to me, the most important thing is you sit and listen to the people that are important in that person's life. Whoever the client is, they come with people with them. You need to listen to those people. Um, so we've talked about this. Cognitive-based, insight-oriented approaches never work. Tell me how you feel. I don't know. Well, if I do this and you do that and what's going to be the... We don't do cognitive stuff. We do immediate processing everything through our body stuff. And insight-oriented approaches don't work. What does work? Supports, consistency, structure. And if things don't go good, start thinking on your feet. Rethink it. Don't do the same old, same old with a population that... And remember, what we're talking about with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, it doesn't matter what your face looks like. It doesn't matter how tall you are. The big problem is that your brain is not working the way it's supposed to. That's what we've got. We have a population that has brain damage, at least we know what caused it, or most of what caused it. We know that it was caused by alcohol. We know that alcohol attacks every system in the body, especially the brain. That's the thing that we need to be the most cognizant of when we're doing screening. How does this person's brain work? Well, we can't go in there and look, but we can ask questions about brain processing, which is all the sensory perceptual stuff, the learning, the memory, the emotional control, the executive functionings of planning, decision-making, transitioning. We're asking those questions, yes, because we're nosy, but also because it gives us information about how that person's brain works. And then for me, because I have the training in neuropsychological assessment, I can go in and actually assess what's working and what isn't working. Okay? But I already have a really good idea of what's not working anyway because I've had a really good chat with the people that are involved with this individual and they've given me an idea of what's working and what isn't working. I know where the problems are. I know where I'm going because I know that this is what we're looking for. We're looking for that piece of information that's going to say, yep, we know that there has been exposure to alcohol in utero. So, 
there we go. We're talking about brain functioning. These things are hardwired. These problems are hardwired. Um, I remember when we were doing very early training with the Alberta Medical Association, who's been so, so good about getting, um, you know, the clinical practice guidelines and making sure there's lots of training for physicians. Uh, they've been really, really good with that. I had a, qu uh, a question from someone, I, can't, I don't know if it was a psychiatrist or a neurologist, but he said, well, there's that, you know, what about cognitive remediation? Because there's that whole cognitive rehabilitation process we do with people who've had a brain injury. And I said, that's a really good question. But when we're dealing with someone who's had a stroke or who's had a brain injury, we're assuming that pre-injury, their functioning level was good. Everything was working the way it was supposed to. So we actually have intact skills that we, we can reroute things through. The problem with this particular population is we don't have areas where we have intact skills. Everything tends to be distorted. Even at the cellular level, things aren't working the way they're supposed to. We have too many connections. We have not enough connections in some spots. We have way too much in other spots. We have white matter. We have gray matter. We have thinning of the corpus callosum. We have everything that could possibly go wrong. We've got it all. So we can't go in and say, okay, this system worked intactly before this because there never was a before this. The alcohol has been there since conception. So it has changed the system dramatically. So cognitive remediation might give you isolated skills, but it's not necessarily going to change the way the whole system works. And the brain works as a whole. It doesn't work as a bit here and a bit there and a bit there and a, you know, a bit over there. Everything all works together, and if it's not working, it's really not working. So I don't think we need to be going through that. There we go. Well, difference in working with children and adults, you know that. With kids, you work with the supports. You focus on behavior. Behavior is the thing that drives them all crazy. When you're in school, it's behavior. We just had the most frustrating conversation the other day with a school principal, and she kept saying, oh, well, first of all, she had the wrong report. She had the wrong Dr. Massey. She kept phoning me and asking me for stuff, and actually my husband had done it, so that was the first problem. The second problem was that this kid had been, oh, we had an assessment from a hospital system. We had two previous assessments from um, their own particular school system. He already came with a diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder and uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and then ARND, alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder. Well, she was really frustrated because she thought he wouldn't get any funding unless he got a diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder. I said, he's already got that one. But the big one for you is alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder. That goes with Alberta, that goes with code 44, that means you've got funding for at least three years and you don't have to reassess this little guy forever. You know, it stands, it's a medical diagnosis. Nothing's going to change in terms of that diagnosis. It's there. So it's, but this child was in a behavior class and actually doing very well because there was structure. I said, well, why can't he stay in that class? He still has the oppositional defiant disorder from before he got the ARND diagnosis. So why can't he stay there get the funding for, why can't you be creative? And I don't know whether she could be that creative. I don't know whether her system was going to let her do that. Um, so you have to work with what's not working. And with kids, it's often behavior. You focus on management, life skills, education, all that kind of stuff. With adults, this is where it gets a little tricky because adults can be difficult to work with. Not because they're difficult, but because <coughs> they're often transient. They often have really significant problems in terms of medical health. They have lots of problems with stability. They often have concomitant addictions. That makes them a little difficult to deal with, right? They, you book an appointment, they don't come in. And they come in maybe next week, or maybe they forgot, or maybe they phone up, or, may, you know, or, or whatever. Unless somebody brings them in, they don't come in. So you have to operate as a case management kind of um, a case management way of doing things and that means sometimes what I have to do is spend my time figuring out who is in this client's life that can actually get them into the office. How can you do it? We've done some really good stuff with corrections. I don't want to bash corrections because you know I think they're I think they're doing a really um, good job with a really difficult population and I've done some really good work with um, some of the individuals that are kind of in the Stan Daniels Center, and we know that these people are alcohol affected, we know that they're having problems, um, but we know that they can't get to places 
on their own, so their probation officer brings them in, or someone from, from the actual facility will bring them in. And we've done some really good work with that because the pro what we don't want is these guys to get released into the community with no supports, because if they do, guess what? They operate on rote learning, they go back to what they know, and they'll be in jail again probably within like three weeks. So how do we make sure that they've got an income? For a lot of the people I see, they, they are not going to be able to work competitively. So we're looking at support through AISH. For some of the individuals I see, they are so low functioning that they actually quali qualify for what we call um, PDD supports. For people in Alberta, we know what that is, persons with developmental disabilities. For for those of you in other sites. Uh, it's basically um, a program where individuals with developmental disabilities, low functioning uh, cognitively and problems with adaptive skills can get financial assistance, not money in hand, but services. And a lot of the people that I see, if we can get them into stable housing, get them out of addictions, get them away from a criminal element, and get them supported employment, they'll actually do okay. But if we send them out of the Stan Daniel Center or remand and say, here, go off and have a nice life, and by the way, don't get into trouble anymore, it ain't going to work. They're going to be in trouble right away because they will go where, they, where they're known, where it's safe. And that's usually back to the streets. So there we go. That's the first thing we do for intervention. We develop, we get a, an accurate diagnosis. You get an accurate diagnosis if you've got good screening. That's how it works. So we know what the diagnosis looks like in Alberta. It's got Alberta Clinical Practice Guidelines and the national standards. We've, it's a medical diagnosis. It doesn't change. We have to have confirmation of maternal alcohol consumption from a reliable source. That can be really difficult, OK? A reliable source is not the really, really, really angry ex-husband with an ax to grind. That's not a reliable source. He may be absolutely accurate, but it's not, it's not independent enough, right? You have to have someone who goes, OK, no, 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 this is what I saw. And, and so we pull hospital records. We call everybody. If a bio mom is around, we'll talk to bio mom. We will always try and contact bio moms if they're still alive. A lot of times they're not, OK? If, if we've got a grandma that's around, or an auntie that's around, or someone in the community that's around, we'll try and talk to them. I've got two cases now from uh, a very small northern community where these individuals are up for very, very serious charges. And we have to call someone in the community who can tell us whether or not these individuals were exposed to alcohol in utero. I mean. What the defense lawyers have said is, well, they come from X, so we're just assuming that they're all FAS. And I said, no, 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 we don't do diagnosis by geography. <laughs> it's not by location. We actually have to have that piece of information that's, that's someone reliable, that isn't angry <laughs> at this person, is able to give us the piece of information that we need. Okay? If we don't have it, we can't say it. I can say organic brain damage, and I will, but I can't say it's due to this. So that's a really important piece of the information. Then we have to have all the reports on cognitive functioning. We really try and look for strengths. Okay, This is a population with tremendous strengths. It's not just things that go wrong, because everybody's got things that they don't do so well. The problem for our client group is they've got so many things that are barriers to them being able to use their strengths. That's the problem. They are, you know. A, a lot of the people that I see are wonderfully artistic. They're, they're, they're beautifully artistic. They draw, they paint, they sculpt. But all of the lifestyle stuff that goes along with living on the streets or being addicted or being homeless or being transient um, prevent them from actually using those skills in any way that's going to benefit them. They have wonderful skills as storytellers. At, <laughs> and people go, oh, I know that one. You know, Of course they tell stories. But they still are tremendously engaging, wonderful individuals with huge hearts. Most of the people that I see would never hurt anyone, ever. Kind, decent, vulnerable, easily exploited, and very frightened. You ask someone that's an adult that has FAS, you ask them what their life is like, and they will tell you how hard it is. They are honest to a fault. 
right? They will tell you just how painful things are for them, and they will tell you how scared they are, and then they will tell you how they prevent themselves from being scared or from having anybody in their environment recognize how frightened they are. If you're in an environment that is not safe, the last thing you're going to do is let anybody know that you're scared. Because once you're scared, you're a target, right? So these are people where I, I think they firmly believe that the best defense is a good offense. They hit first, right? If you're the tough, mean guy, uh, if, you're the, if you're the muscle, if you're the weapon that other people point, you know, go beat that guy up, he really pissed me off. Or go beat that guy up because I want X. And that's what happens sometimes with my crew. Um, then no one is going to actually figure out just how scared and vulnerable, how frightened you really are underneath all of that stuff. And that's, that's very, very uh, common with the people that I see. Um, so what does a good diagnosis do? Well, rules out other disorders. I will tell you that in the, all the times that I've worked in, the, the clinics that I've worked in, we have seen brain tumors that weren't picked up until our doctor did an assessment. We have seen, I think we have one right now that we are checking out for porphyria, which is a pretty serious neurological condition, uh, MS, multiple sclerosis, lupus, um, heart murmurs, serious heart murmurs that need to be investigated, undiagnosed diabetes, um, you name it, we've seen it. Uh, and these are people because they tend not to keep appointments and tend to be transient, don't get good medical care. So these are all conditions that need to be treated that often aren't treated. And they exist in addition to the FASD, right? Uh, again, we talked about strengths and deficits. We're looking at intervention and intervention planning, and we're trying to figure out the difference between a permanent deficit and a learned pattern, because a lot of people, remember, they, they've learned to be tough to survive, but that's not really who they are. When we're talking about screening, these are questions you ask in the screening interview. Medical interventions, you ask what's gone on medically. Head injuries, other diagnoses, how many times you've been in the hospital because you're, you know, your old man beat the crap out of you or put you in a chokehold or you know, broke your arm or broke your nose and stuff like that. Domestic violence in this population is huge. Women are often victimized, often victimized and often subjected to horrific abuse. Um, so you want them to get them into a doctor. Thank heavens I've been doing this long enough that I've got some wonderful physicians in the city that I can just phone up and say, can I give you one more? And they'll go, oh, for crying out loud, all right. You know, all right. And these are physicians who don't mind if somebody doesn't show up because they know that this is a population that is not always going to follow through. But they're really good, and they're really good at working with people with addictions issues as well. So I'm, I'm very blessed. Um, okay, all, you know, go with them to the appointment. I can't do that, but I can try and, I can try and um, muster the resources so that somebody does. Okay, brain tumors, diabetes, cancer. We've, we've seen this. In, in people that are just coming in for an FAS diagnosis. Financial interventions, I won't go through all of that stuff. But these are the questions you ask, because if you can't manage your finances, you can't effectively parent, right? You're going to have limited money as it is, and you're not going to effectively parent if you can't manage your money. Housing is a crucial issue. A lot of the people that we see are hard to house. They, if we're able to get them into Edmonton Housing, which is, you know, or Capital, what is it, Capital Region Housing, which is for people who need supported uh, in, uh, housing opportunities, they often lose that placement because people come and crash, and then they have parties, and then they break the windows, and then the neighbors get mad, and then what happens is my client's out on the street again, right? So lots of problems with housing. And again, we always ask about that. Supported living, low-income housing, there we go. I think we've got all of this in there. Okay, parenting and family. If you are different from everybody else and you've always felt unloved and you've always felt that people have never understood you and you have issues with neglect and abandonment and loss and you are a young woman, what are you going to do? You are going to have babies because babies, this is what we think, babies love you unconditionally and that's what you're looking for. So you have babies, and you have lots of babies, and every time you have another guy in your life, you have another baby, because that's how you tie yourself to your partner. Um, so parenting issues are huge. A lot of the parenting assessments that I do, uh, 
of course, I always ask alcohol because I always ask that for everybody. But that's pretty well a common thread that a lot of the young women that I see are having problems with parenting because they're alcohol affected. And then I will ask questions about their mums and guess what, they were alcohol affected. And it's this generational thing that just painfully repeats itself. So we have to make sure kids are safe. We have to make sure kids are safe. But remember, we've got a, a mother who may effectively be functioning like a child as well, and she's not safe. But we expect her to be able to get herself out of nasty situations when she can't. She just doesn't have the skills. So lots of in-home supports if we can. And, and yes, sometimes kids need to go into care. And sometimes we have to have respite. Actually, all the time we have to have respite because that saves the family from burning out. Um, employment, for sure. This is an old slide, so it says HR&E, which is Human Resources and Employment. Now in Alberta, it's Alberta Employment Industry and Immigration, or Immigration and Industry. No immigration, and industry. Hmm? No immigration on it anymore. It's just oh, they took immigration they off? Don't. I thought... They took the industry off. They, they did? So it's A-E-I instead yeah. of A-E-I-I. -I. Okay, well, there you go. So you didn't know that one. So... We need to be looking at supporting individuals if they can't work full time. We need to be looking at education, right? And education not necessarily because it's going to flip you into the competitive labor market, maybe education because you need to learn to read a little better or because it gives you what we call quality of life. Going to school is quality of life for a lot of people. It gives them a reason to get up in the morning. Um, legal interventions are huge. A lot of the people we see are in trouble with the law, uh, either as victims or perpetrators. We talked about that before. And almost all of them have issues with substance abuse. Almost all of them. If you feel really crappy and you don't fit, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to go out and you're going to find something that makes you fit with somebody. And if you're using, you've always got pals. Right? There's no such thing as a lonely drunk. <laughs> You've always got buddies that you go out drinking with. Very few people sit in, a, sit in a closet and drink. They're out there at the bar with everybody else. So there's lots of problems with, with substance abuse, and we really do need to try and clean some people up. Right? So detox is huge. I think in Alberta we still have that initiative where if you're pregnant and you want to do treatment, you go to the head of the line. Yay. That's what we want. We want pregnant women to go to the head of the line because we're doing harm reduction, right? Mental health issues are huge. Mental health issues are huge. Depression is huge. Anxiety is huge. Personality disorders look really, really big in this population because, frankly, if you're needy and whiny and you call your psychiatrist every day because you can't cope, you're going to look like you're borderline. You don't want the borderline label. <laughs> but that's what happens when you, are, when you are desperate and you are alone. You will, you will call whoever's there. So the FAS1 magnitude of the problem, we know. This is a complex medical diagnosis. It's a complex neurodevelopmental problem. Neuro is brain. Development means all the way through. We know that this has lifelong implications huge social problems okay and I think the best the best one is you can't do everything but you can do something right we're not out there saving the world but we're out there saving the world one person at a time whatever that looks like maybe saving this person means that we get them into an HIV treatment program maybe that's what it means for this person maybe saving this person means the next time her partner beats the you-know-what out of her, the police lay charges, right? It, doesn't, it still doesn't happen all the time. It's supposed to, but it doesn't happen all the time. One person at a time, one problem at a time, okay? Good self-care. We know it's a lifelong condition. We know that there's going to be crisis after crisis after crisis, okay? We know that the moment we, we remove supports, it all falls apart. And you are going to get tired. If you're doing this, you're going to get tired. So you learn how to do good self-care. And when you go off to Phoenix and you're sitting by the pool, try not to look at the woman who's having four glasses of white wine and is pregnant. Really try hard. And, and that just about kills me. And don't say anything. What can you say that is going to make a difference? You're probably going to get plowed. <laughs> <laughs> or the best you're going to get cussed out. I mean, like, what can you say? I haven't yet figured out what I should do in a situation like that. It kills me. I don't know what to do. I don't know whether I should just quietly drop a little card with my number and a, you know, that, 
pregnant woman and the red slash symbol, you know, I don't know what I should do. I don't know if I put a card there and say, call me when you sober up. You know, like, I don't know what to do. But that is one of those things that drives me crazy because I can't turn my head off. I don't know if I'm like you, but when I go away and I'm supposed to be relaxing, I can't turn my head off. I see this stuff all the time and it drives me crazy. I remember one time we, we went off to Hawaii. This was a while ago. We don't travel all the time, just to let you know. We don't just travel all the time. We actually work. But we were in Hawaii and it was this huge, it was the Marine Corps were doing something at the hotel we were at. And I'm thinking, oh, don't, don't, don't see anybody. Don't see anybody drinking when they're pregnant. Don't, because if, you know, if I piss off some Marine, oh, don't, you know. And I just kind of kept my head down, but I didn't relax. I couldn't relax because I couldn't turn it off. I have this knowledge. And it kills me, okay? It, I don't know what to do with it. So you be involved. You do what you can. You try and turn your head off. Um, and you ask the right questions. You always ask the right questions. And you hand out the questionnaires, but you do them after. And if clients look at you and go, not another questionnaire, you go, you know what, maybe we don't need to do it this time. We do have, uh, actually I brought it with me, there is a, um, there's a screening device that we're looking at for the Pacific Northwest fetal alcohol. Um, let me just get off camera for a minute here. But I brought it because, oh, I think it's over in another file. It's over there. I brought it because it is... We're trying to figure out questions to ask. So part of this is research, and part of this is intake. So if you're doing a clinic, right, or you're doing intake, or you're doing screening, these are some of the questions to ask. And I will tell you how long this thing is. Now this doesn't mean how long, this isn't how long it's going to be, but at this point, it's 22 pages long. Double-sided. And I don't think anybody that I see could get past page two, not because they don't want to do it, not because they don't want to be cooperative, because they can't read it. You know, and, and no, no criticism, Dr. Claren, I love you dearly, and I think this is going to be a really good instrument, but I know that my clients can't do this. So this is something that I would have to do on my own after I have done my incredibly thorough interview. Because my clients can't handle this. Not a chance. And there's really good information because what we're trying to gather out of this is stuff about all the other messy ways people li people's lives fall apart. And I think it's got really good clinical value in terms of the information it's going to give us. But I know for a fact that I'm not going to be able to give that to my client population base, partly because of literacy. Ed uh, stuff, partly because they're just so burned out they can't do it. They cannot possibly go through another questionnaire. So for me it always boils down to a good, a good screening is a good interview. Good screening involves a face-to-face -face relationship with somebody. You don't have that face-to-face -face relationship with someone, you give them this, they are not going to tell you squat. <laughs> they just aren't. Because all through their lives Pieces of paper like this have been used to either deny them services and supports or punish them, take away children, right? Charge them with fraud. I don't know, you know, uh, get them into trouble with the law. They're very, my population, and maybe I'm dealing with a special population, but I don't really think I am. Um, not in terms of the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder world. I think I'm dealing with a pretty general cross section. They are so, so wary of paper. Paper has always been used in a negative way. So for me, what hasn't been used well is face-to-face -face and, and dialogue and conversation. We need to talk, right? We need to talk about things as people, as people who share in the same community, who have the same values, who have the same goals, who have the same aspirations for our children. How do we make this work? But in order to do that, we have to get honest and for my client population, it's way too easy to make something up and put it on a piece of paper. If I want honest, I have to talk and I have to listen, which is very hard for me because I talk a lot. So I know that we're really almost done. And even though I knew that there were people out there 
in television land? Gee, I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> um, I wonder if anybody has questions or comments from any of the sites, because I know we've got people all over the place. Maybe we'll start with this room here. Okay, we'll just have to do with the room. I've been, I've been given a heads up. Any, any comments, any questions from anybody here? Probably sounds a lot like same old, same old. And it may very well be. The incidence and prevalence. I think, I think I saw something lately. One in a hundred births. That's that's the last thing they were saying on CBC. But I think we're still dealing with something that is very underreported. Very underreported. Uh, and again, what we tend to do, especially, um, we tend to target certain populations and ask them the painful questions where I like to target everybody and ask them the painful questions. We know about um, high-risk drinking populations, okay? The one that everyone talks about first, and I don't necessarily think that's fair, uh, is First Nations communities. And I think one of the reasons we talk about that first is because they were the first people to say, wait a minute, we got a problem here. We don't want to do this anymore. So First Nations populations, absolutely. The next group, military families. Hey, any place where alcohol is part of what you do for fun and you play hard and you, and you work hard and when you relax, you really relax, right? Uh, and the next group is college-educated women, right? Binge drinking in college-educated women is huge. You don't even need a reason. You know, it's Tuesday, all right, we're off to the power plant, woohoo. You know, and they don't, you know, that's what happens. We're at the end of exams, okay, okay, okay. You know, and that's what happens. So those are the three populations. So that doesn't really leave anybody out. Pretty well everybody. So I'm thinking one in a hundred births, and, and I'm thinking that's probably still an underestimation. There's a lot of kids out there that have been called ADD, ADHD. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, if we dig a little deeper, we ask the right questions, I don't know. I'm cynical. <laughs> I'm really cynical. There was another question down at the end of the table. Um, I was going to ask about supports for higher functioning FAS kids. Yeah. Um, they're often, they often go undiagnosed because yeah. the school doesn't tag them as needing yeah. a diagnosis, yeah. even though the caregivers know that that's what's going on because you've met the birth family and the generation before. Yeah. So what resources exist? Well, I think the same level of resources exist, but the thing that drives it is the diagnosis. You have to get the diagnosis because if a family's functioning, time, uh, fun functioning fine at this particular little snapshot in time, that's great. But what happens if we hit that transition and then all of a sudden all hell breaks loose and we don't have a diagnosis? We can't get those supports in place fast enough. This is not one of those things that you can do in a crisis. This is a diagnosis that needs to happen when you've got the information. No matter how well the family's coping, no matter how well this child is doing, you get it because who knows what's going to happen later. And you get it, and if you've got the information, it doesn't matter whether the school isn't seeing any problems. Maybe at this point it isn't, but maybe next year if the teacher changes and things are different, it will get worse. And this is not uh, a problem that does well in a crisis model. We have to do it before there's a crisis because guess what? There will be one. It's just a question of when. And in terms of the, the, the interventions, anything that would go for a child who really is struggling is going to be, should be available to a child who isn't struggling yet or who may not be struggling now but who may struggle later. You want that stuff in place. The only way you get it is with a diagnosis. And the only way you get incidence and, pre and prevalence levels is with accurate diagnosing. So the thing that drives it is the diagnostic process. And I mean, Alberta is lucky because we have uh, a lot of sites in the province that follow those clinical practice guidelines and who follow the Canadian standards. We're doing a really good job, but we're still missing lots of people. We're still missing people. So any other questions? Everyone's just done. <laughs> so done. <laughs> anyway, I would like to thank you all for coming, this audience here, especially given the weather. It's horrible out there. 
Uh, and thank you again for the opportunity to talk about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, I could go on and on. I have gone on and on. Um, I do go on and on. Uh, but I'm really passionate about this. I'm really passionate about this. And this has been something that I've been working on for years. And I really, you know, I keep saying I want to work myself out of a job. Eventually, people will really get tired of having to listen to me. And they will stop drinking just to shut me up. You know, that's what I'm thinking. So anyway, thank you very much for all those sites in other places, BC, Nunavut, I think Whitehorse, maybe the Yukon, I don't know. But uh, thanks very much. I think there were some from Manitoba too. So thanks very much for the opportunity to, to talk with you. And if there are any questions, you've got my email. You certainly can, can give me a call. I'd be, uh, actually phone works better for me. So I'll give you my phone number. It's 780-471. 1860. That actually works better than email for me, just in case. Jacqueline could tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Jacqueline. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much, everybody. So I'll just reiterate that. Thank you very yeah. much for presenting today. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.